Introduction Contact Reports Volume Slash Issue 1 7689 Contact No. 138 from 28.1 1975 to 13.11 1975 Stats Source Contact Reports Band Slash Block 1 6580 Contact No. 123 from 28.1 1975 to 3.6 1975 stats date slash time of contact to as day 18th March 1975 15 for translator James Moore date of original translation 2015 2019 corrections and improvements made Stephen Zut contact person Sam Jace Synopsis Billy asks Sam Yesay to explain the origin of material and energy. They also discuss chromosomes and gems. This is the entire contact. It is an authorized and official translation and may contain errors. Sfimala Dark of Contact Report A Translation Ace Contact Tuesday, 18th March 1975, 15 for this contact took place two days earlier than originally for Zin and Sammy say returned from your assignment two days earlier. Today I have a lot of questions, if you allow. If there are not too many of them. I don't know. My first one concerns the material. What is it? Material is a palpable idea. It is a solid form of energy that is palpable. That is commonsensical, but how does material come into being? The principle is very simple. However, I'm not allowed to tell it. However, it is a fact that any energy can be converted into solid forms. It is only necessary to highly focus and highly concentrate the respective energy, whereby it can be converted into solid material. In this way the elementary building blocks of the solid substance of the material are created. Neutron, proton and electron. From these, the atoms and the variety of the chemical compounds form, which then in their three different states of aggregation form the solid external casing, which is nevertheless known to your scientists. Solid material as well as our kind of energy are in every respect of equal value. That is to say that our kind of energy is absolute material, just as our kind of material is absolute energy. That means that without exception anything in the universe consists of material or energy. The two terms, energy and material, represent fundamentally one and the same, but they specify their two different forms, the coarse substantial and the fine fluidal. Coarse substantial on a two means material. Fine fluid all three means energy. Well and right, but that doesn't explain my question. Because I want to know how material does fundamentally come into being. From our energy, of course. You are not being precise enough. I think that prior to the ur energy something else is probably a decisive factor because as far as I know two factors each forming a oneness in itself always need to come together in order to result in a oneness again. You are relentless and are bringing me into a quandary. I don't want that. All right, I'll explain everything to you as far as I'm allowed. Although. You apparently once again know more in this respect than we know about you. Material is the embodiment of an idea. As energy, material is fine fluidal, and as mass, it is just highly concentrated and condensed. Both types can be produced by apparatus, which you two are already practicing in various forms. Normally, however, they are produced completely naturally, namely through spiritual power, which is preceded by the idea. Fundamentally, the creation is responsible for this. A tremendous spiritual form, a factor that, in turn, embodies our kind of energy. It is from the creation that the idea arises. The power of the spirit then condenses and concentrates the idea into fine fluidal energy, which is then condensed by even greater concentration into the coarse substantial, into the material. And the whole universe with all the trimmings is actually only an idea condensed and concentrated into the fine fluidal and coarse substantial energy. Sure. What then is this tremendous spiritual form the creation factor? 
The creation consists of an idea in the creation, condensed in the creation to the archive spiritual energy. We also do not know more about the creation. Then you do not really know more than I do in this regard. That is so, because when a life form is able to reveal this secret, it becomes part of the creation as such. That's about how I imagined it to be. But I still have further questions, Semjais. Just ask. But be conscious of the fact that I am not allowed to reveal any secrets that would still be detrimental to the development of the consciousness of the human being of Earth. Therefore, please spare me questions that are of a scientific nature and so forth, because in the future, I would have to leave them unanswered. But precisely such questions I still have in store because I have been instructed to ask them to you. If these questions for the answering fall under my authority, then I will of course answer them for you, however only for the sake of your image since the answers to the questions are still being expected. But do not ask any such questions in the future, because I would have to withhold the answers from you. Such questions would lead too far and ultimately bring the human beings of Earth more cognitions than would be good for them. Their development of consciousness is still just too inhibited in every respect. If, on the other hand, you bring up questions of yourself that are in your own developmental interest, then I can go very decidedly further in answering them, this you know. It's just that then, you must not talk about certain things, and you are asked to keep them to yourself. Your friends and acquaintances have in no way progressed so far that they would understand certain things. According to the scheme you can classify some of them under the periods 3-2 and 3-1 as well as 3-3. Only one among your current friends falls within level 3-7. But they are all still subject to the urge and need of wanting to advance further than is consciousness-based beneficial to them. Hence, they also raise questions for you, which exceed their processing capabilities. And as a result of the same urge, they also wish to be able to enter into contact with us. This, although they know very well that this will not be possible. They must first recognize the fundamental elementary truth and acknowledge it as such before they can go any further. But they are still in the stage of doubt and do not want to let the truth of truth as such become effective in themselves. I didn't want to offend you, Semjais. I also did not perceive it that way, but I had to explain all that to you. Thanks, but may I now ask the remaining questions? Sure. What about our molecular biology? Are we on the right path of development with this? Even very far-reaching. You are only lacking a few cognitions, which will open unimagined doors for you. Your scientists are on the verge of making very great discoveries and cognitions, which will result in very great possibilities. I'm not allowed to explain any more about it to you. I'm content with that, thanks. My next question is about the gen which makes up the hereditary factor. Are you allowed to tell me something about it? It is the carrier of hereditary properties in the color bodies. That is clear to me, but how does a gen originate, and are the chromosomes equal in all life forms? They are not, as far as the second question is concerned. Depending on the kind of being, they are different and they also vary in their number. Human life forms, however, normally have the same number of chromosome pairs. Do these color bodies then have any influence on the age limit of the life form, or is the age a genetically determined factor? Certainly, it is a result of the genes. The genes control the cell functions via the brain and the spirit, and they direct life, regeneration and decay of the cells. Thanks, that's sufficient already. What functions do the chromosomes themselves have? They determine type, form and gender of the life form. They are also the fundamental carriers of the genes, which exert their factorial influences on the chromosomes and, depending on the factor present, cause them to switch to normal or false circuits and can also cause mutations. Does Mongolism also fall under such a mutation? 
in this context only partially, because this is fundamentally based on a damage of germs due to numerous possibilities, which in many cases is able to generate a supernumerary chromosome. Unfortunately, I don't understand enough of this, but the answer is sufficient for me. However, what do these chromosomes consist of? Mainly of proteins and nucleic acids. Good, but now what about heredity? You just don't let up. Each gene results in the inheritance of once existing characteristics. Each individual attribute contains the attributes of both determinative factors, namely the negative and the positive, the male and the female. However, due to various possible influences, faulty circuits or faulty breeds can result, from which mutated life forms can develop. It can also happen that a dominant gene overshadows a recessive gene, whereby this gene cannot reach the development. Nevertheless, both genes can then be passed on. Of course, genes are also able to change in the course of time because, like everything else in the universe, they too are subject to an evolutionary or degenerative process. I understand, even if this is not exactly a distinct field of knowledge of mine. But what about the inheritance of knowledge or simply the intelligence? This is in no way related to the genes, because intelligence is the result of the evolution of the consciousness. However, spiritual and consciousness-based thinking and its resulting factors such as knowledge, essence of wisdom and intelligence are pure factors of the consciousness, which can therefore express themselves consciousness-based and organically in the brain which consists of acid substances. These acids form the carriers of consciousness-based essence of wisdom and intelligence in a solid form, while the spirit, however, fundamentally contains within itself the same knowledge as a fine fluidal factor. Even as a coarse substantial life form, everything is determined by two factors, so therefore the purely spiritual or fine fluidal life form as well as the coarse substantial form must be present. In this case this means therefore that essence of wisdom and intelligence are present as spiritual energetical as well as material consciousness based coarse substantial forms as organic acids. This enables that essence of wisdom and intelligence can be further transplanted in a coarse substantial manner. This means that, for example, these acids can be taken from one brain and be genetically modified in order to replant them into another brain. As a result, Entire races of life forms can be brought to an equal level of essence of wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence without each individual being having to go through the different evolutionary periods. In this way, even a new spirit form can be turned into a highly developed knowledge and life form. But your scientists have already been working in this direction for a long time and have also had very good successes to record, even though this is not known to the general public. Intelligence and essence of wisdom are thus in no way the result of genes, and they are also not transmitted and brought along by the spirit itself which inhabits the body. This means therefore, that an intellectual or very wise human being can bring offspring, which the earth human describes as mentally ill and idiotic, whereas however human beings who are weak in consciousness and intelligence can procreate offspring of horrendous development of consciousness and intelligence. This is really only connected with the extent to which the respective material consciousness residing in a body is itself developed in terms of knowledge. If, however, essence of wisdom and intelligence were the result of genes then a new spirit would never find a home, while the already existing life form would very quickly be destroyed and extinct because it would be spiritualized too quickly. This would be the case because only more and more highly developed life would be procreated and thus no opportunities for new spirits to live and develop would be offered any longer. But why then are the so-called spirit illnesses inheritable? There are no real spirit illnesses, but only material illnesses of consciousness, and these are based on a delusion, brought about with Jewalt Semke of a consciousness that is either still underdeveloped in terms of knowledge or is already educated. And since the genes are influenced by the consciousness, they catch the confused impulses, store them and create the confused idea to become the confused life form. Life forms disturbed in such a way, however, normalize again from generation to generation, 
through the unstoppable further development of the spirit and through the regeneration of the consciousness, through the evolution which is caused periodically. This means thus that by the confused material consciousness, which uses the power of the spirit, vital functions of the jinns are impaired, namely by the faulty control of certain factors. This faulty control then in turn sets off its impulses in order to intersperse the brain acids with the same false factors and to cause a confusion, a delusion that as a result actually becomes organic. The evolution of the consciousness, however, ensures that the delusion can normalize again over generations, as I have already mentioned. Life forms disturbed in such a way may be burdened differently depending on their kind, but likewise their offspring. Depending on the stage of development of the body inhabiting spirit of the offspring, these can become more or less disturbed in their consciousness, a very low developed consciousness quite decidedly more than a highly developed one, where be it is even feasible that through the power of the spirit such faulty controls are able to neutralize themselves. So it is absolutely possible that a life form ill in consciousness produces offspring that are in no way abnormal, as you say. But on the other hand, after many generations, after everything is normalized again, small underdeveloped factor elements may, in isolated cases, allow certain damages to break out, which lead back to them. Fantastic, but there are so many so-called mental illnesses dot dot dot. That would take us too far. Of course, if I may then ask you another question. Sure. It concerns the problem of the theory of relativity in particular time dilation. You know about that, though. I'm not asking for myself because the questioners want an answer from you. Oh, I see, of course, but I must expand a little on this. There are various possibilities for mastering the space. To describe them all, however, would make no sense as they would be too incomprehensible and too fantastic for the human beings of Earth. With flying objects, however, there is only a single possibility for mastering the space safely. This possibility is that of hyperspace, in which a dilation of time is abolished, since the theory of relativity remains just that, a theory. But the elimination of a time shift or time dilation requires the breaking through to the hyperspace, as I've already explained before. I'm not allowed to give more precise details. But in any case, the jump occurs very quickly under the momentary paralysis of the protective shield and with suddenly increased speed, which results in an instantaneous expansion of the mass. This means that the process to be initiated occurs so quickly that the speed in certain processes, which are generated by a pertuses, distort the material within millionths of a fraction of a second, making it a fine form which is capable of timelessly traversing the superspace. As said, it's not just about the speed, even though it exceeds that of light thousands of millions of times, but various other processes are additionally required. Only due to the speed itself the effect of the mass changing is created, which is what makes a hyperjump possible. The mass of a body grows in proportion to the increase in its speed. This means that the mass grows endlessly. However, our ships are protected by protective shields, and these prevent this process, and only the switching off of the shield allows for the distorting effect. It is precisely this process, then, that is then exploited to accelerate the actual distortion and to cause a dematerialization. As a result, space and time become paralyzed at the same time and cancel each other out, meaning that the ship is already rematerializing at its destination when it dematerializes at the point of departure. This whole process lasts no longer than a millionth of a fraction of a second, so that also life forms crossing the hyperspace do not have to pay the price for changes of any kind. If space a ship's fly slower than the speed of light, then this requires firstly an irresponsible amount of time, which is however particularly with newcomers to space travel always the case. Everyone only learns from experiences and cognitions. Secondly, this type of spaceflight is very dangerous and puts every reaching of destination into question. If a spaceship breaks through the speed of light without using the hyperspace, however, then that catastrophe, which you call the theory of relativity, befalls the ship and its occupants. 
speeds above that of the light harbor all sorts of dangers. If the barrier of hyperspace is not breached and superspace is not made in only time dilation is just one of these dangers. Another danger is that in this case, too, the mass of a spacecraft expands to infinity in relation to its speed and can, under certain circumstances, result in the destruction of the ship and its occupants. There are, however, still many other dangers. Nevertheless, all life forms must complete their evolutionary process, through which they gain experiences and knowledge. Also our forebears had to struggle with these problems and got lost in space and time. However, the same has happened and is happening to other life forms. Hence, it happens again and again that some time travelers from the past appear, which often causes very big problems for them. Often they can no longer find their home worlds or else find them completely destroyed. In this way, every now and then there are also creatures from other galaxies who appear, who have also already reached all the way to the Earth and will continue to come again and again. Some such time travelers have also already gotten stranded on Earth in earlier times and have never managed to leave again. Old strange legends and tales about them are known among you. Nevertheless, in the course of time many of these creatures died out, or they degenerated or mixed with the earthly life forms. It is not uncommon for such time travelers to still visit the Earth today. And many are among them, who never find their home worlds again and, therefore, simply settle somewhere on other worlds. Often, however, they also get lost in the expanse of space and die. Not seldom they are thousands and even millions of years on the move, while for them however only few minutes or few years pass. The dangers of speed are very great, and they already start at just a few kilometers per hour, if the flying objects or vehicles are not shielded. Even minimal speeds of a few kilometers per hour impair the material in its shape, structure, and stability, if no protective measures are present. A natural consequence is the expansion of mass and the decomposition of material. This means that even at low speeds, the mass of a vehicle or flying object imperceptibly increases in relation to the speed and causes the effect of slow destruction. As said, this already happens at a few kilometers per hour of speed and in minimalistic terms that are hardly detectable with your technology. At low speeds, the process also takes a very long time and may under certain circumstances require hundreds of years. At very high speeds, however, the time is reduced to decades or a few years. Also the life forms themselves are impaired by this process, because also their masses change because of the speed. The function of the brain becomes affected because its mass changes. This has the consequence that all functions are slowed down and outages occur. In other words, this means that all of a sudden, the thinking and reaction functions stop and a void develops. The life form thereby loses control over itself and its vehicle. The life form effectively loses control over its own functions. Of course, any life form is capable of gradually getting used to and controlling these factors to some extent. However, for every life form there is somewhere the absolute limit where it simply must fail. According to earthly terms, it may often take years before such incidents plague you a human being. Young and powerful in every respect, the human being is able to endure very much. However, there also comes his or her time when he or she becomes subject to the disregarded laws of nature. Every individual is different from another, and so also his or her limits. One thing is certain, though, once a life form fails in this respect, its limit of what is tolerable has been reached and it must no longer operate any may chains of any kind that reach more than the speed of its own walking, unless such may chains are protected against the mass expanding influences. If the human beings of Earth would observe and follow this recommendation, then they would have less hardship, misery, invalids, and fatalities to record. But the human being is willfully stubborn, as he or she has been for ages, and he or she doesn't want to be taught. Still today, he or she considers himself slash herself the crown of the creation and lives in the delusion of being the only human life form in the universe. Nevertheless, you should spread these words among all those who have already controlled their megalomania and want to follow our remarks. Fantastic! 
Our utopia writers compared with these things are really just miserable pen pushers without imagination. Make no mistake, because many of them come very close to the possibilities and the truth. Especially good writers of this kind are often even inspired by us and other powers, and their works prepare the human beings for what is to come. But also in this way, scientists are made aware of certain areas and possibilities, upon which they then do research in certain directions and achieve success. Can you just say that? Certainly, because time has come for this explanation, and furthermore very many human beings are already thinking about it, even if they only suspect these connections. In the rapid development of technology and so on over the last 100 years is thus not solely the work of the human beings on the Earth? No, because also we and many others have contributed some things, even though the development is conditioned by the age. You mean the Aquarian Age? Sure, that's the era I'm talking about. It will bring developmental change events for the human beings of Earth. Very good ones but also very bad ones. Particularly grave are in this regard the religious influences, because this intellectual spiritual consciousness based era brings forth very many new and evil types of religions and sects, where through the human being is supposed to be even more struck in their delusion, where be also sectarian mass suicides and murders are to be feared. But we want to try to prevent this, because otherwise the same thing will happen that happened to our ancestors, Namely that the sect rulers and scientists will as time goes by also elevate themselves to Jews and bring about the same catastrophe over creatures and solar systems as it was also characteristic of our forebears and many other races. Particularly the scientists are always the ones who first recognize the truth, that above a life form and above all stands the creation alone, who behaves completely passively, however, in every respect toward any creations and events in the universe. The naming as such of the creation says what the creation is about. The creation is the creation. Over seven great times, the creation creates life in countless forms over and over again. The creation constantly creates new life forms, unstoppably. But once these are created, they are left to their own devices, with the life task of their development. Another question concerns soul and spirit, Semjais. Am I right with the assumption that they are not one and the same? Of course. Soul and spirit are not two different terms for a single factor, namely not only for the spirit, rather, they are based on two different values. Okay, and what about the human psyche? It is actually the soul, right? You know and understand more about this than any of those you call clerics, psychiatrists, or philosophers. That's a whole garden of flowers. Which, however, you can enjoy. Thank you. But now once again a question regarding the age. You said that the age would be conditioned genetically. Does that apply 100%? Not to that extent, no, because various other factors still play an important role. The most important points with this are the external influences such as living conditions, health, nutrition, and environment and so on. That's what I thought. Are you able to explain more about that to me? That would take us too far. Oh, then. But how is this then, with you? The laws are of equal value throughout the universe. When we have a higher life expectancy than the human being of Earth, then this is conditioned by life. But at the same time research and evolution also play a role that is not insignificant. That's already enough, thank you. Are there therefore any possibilities of influencing the life expectancy according to our current choosing? Of course there are, but I am not allowed to mention these possibilities, especially not in terms of genetic factors. Then let's leave it. However, are you then allowed to tell me something according to which at least symptoms of illness can be contained? In what respect? Although I don't believe in them, I'm thinking of so-called lucky charms of amulets. That's nonsense in every respect. 
What about metal alloys and so forth as well as crystals and precious stones that are supposed to catch or absorb certain radiations? That has its rightness. Special things of this kind have a certain effect. But they achieve only partially successes and are not 100% effective. Fundamentally, however, they are valuable and can save a lot of hardship and suffering, whereby the fact must be seen, nonetheless, that related successes are as a rule only one through delusion and imagination. There are however certain methods to let crystals and precious stones and so on become effective medicines. Can you tell me some? Sure. But I would recommend to you that you keep these things to yourself. Since you don't have regular earnings for reasons, I know best, you could make and sell these things yourself as very useful aids. I am no materialist. That has nothing to do with it, because you too must live. Of course, but I have to think about that first. Do that thoroughly, because you can thereby help many human beings. If that is so... It is so. Then I agree. However, I must comply with the laws that govern us, otherwise I would come in conflict with them. Officially we need a permit for such a trade in the sense mentioned, also for potential medication, and so on. So then listen, dot dot dot, twelve things are named. What purposes they serve and how they must be made. These are exclusively things that are able to influence rheumatism and many other diseases and so on. Thanks, Simjess. But now is there anything else on a larger scale that achieves a better effect? Sure. I can give you the exact description for a machine that brings forth an extraordinary effect for all sorts of ailments and diseases. This machine causes an absolute refreshment of the whole body, a total blood circulation and revitalization in connection with the healing of the most diverse ailments. This is a dot dot dot. Fantastic, Simjays, but how should I build this machine as I lack the financial means for it? You will find patrons for it if you make an effort to do so. The way I see it, though, such a machine with the development and everything would come to at least three zero zero Swiss francs for me. Nevertheless, you will be able to build it, and you also won't have to worry about your living if you really want to strive for it. If you say saw so, dot dot dot, it will be so. I will gladly accept the surprise. But now I have still two other questions. How did the first life arise? Your scientists are mostly aware of that. So, it wasn't just a matter of a living creature being there, but everything developed from a so-called air atmosphere and the amino acids resulting from it? Sure. My last question, we've already spoken several times about the Talmud manual. Emmanuel himself has over the course of the last 2,000 years fundamentally been used again and again as main religious figure. Is the intention of once again using this already long dead human being to make a new belief direction and an idol out of him, is the Talmud manual supposed to serve this purpose? No. Emmanuel himself was just a human being like any other human being which you know better than I do. He was just endowed with very great knowledge. He represents neither a symbol nor an idol nor anything else. He was certainly a teacher, a prophet of the spiritual and conscious-based knowledge and the essence of wisdom, but however nothing beyond that. Any life form should also never be idolized or even worshipped, such as the human being is accustomed to do. Therefore, when we had the Talmud manual gathered from his 2,000-year-old hiding place, it was only for the reason that the time of truth has come. The teaching of Emmanuel is not his teaching but that of the creation and the laws of the creation, which Emmanuel also first had to learn, recognize, and acknowledge. Because of that, he has only made known what the natural laws call for. A mistake of insanity shall not be made another time with Emmanuel being regarded and idolized as the embodiment of the teaching that he brought. The truth of the Talmud shall be taught and recognized as such, 
without a calling into play the name of Jemmanuel and his glorification. Important are only the truth and the laws, but not the person who brought this teaching, laws, and the truth. Hence, if a cult would be established around Jemmanuel another time, then the purpose would not be fulfilled. The human being, Jemmanuel, should not continue to be glorified, as solely the truth and the laws are of absolute importance. But now, my time is up again for today, and I would still like to speak about my task, which I asked you for the last time. Dot, dot, dot. Before you go, Semjays, I still have some very important questions, that is, if you have still enough time and don't mind if I ask about things again that, in my opinion, you've already answered quite thoroughly. However, I have friends and acquaintances who ask me the same questions over and over again. If it's so important, then ask. Thanks, Simjess. The questions are always about friends and acquaintances also wanting to enter into contact with you. At the least, they would already be satisfied if they could just look at or photograph or film you or your beam ship from a distance once. Isn't there nevertheless a possibility to satisfy their curiosity and so on? Have I not expressed myself clearly enough? I've already said several times that this cannot happen, and that under no circumstances. We've chosen you alone, and it stays that way. Nothing can be changed about it. I know that some of your friends only want to enter into contact with me because they doubt your information and want to have proofs. Even the photos you've taken aren't accepted by them as proof because they are too caught up in mistrust and in false assumptions of what is real. They believe that this makes them realistic thinking human beings, but in truth, they are not. Their recognition of reality is not based on the knowledge and cognition but on a line of argument that makes themselves uncertain. They believe that only what they are able to see with their own eyes and touch with their hands is real, whereby they however do not consider that they can be deceived by their own seeing and touching. Proofs are always only valid as reality if they are founded in knowledge and recognition, which means that only consciousness-based hard work enables a real line of argumentation, but never only seeing or touching and so on alone. For these reasons, we gave you several times the opportunity to collect photographic material, where through you could confirm visually all your information in relation to the existence of our beam ships. And although you have many good pictures at your disposal, one does not believe you. On the contrary, further evidence is demanded in the form that we should break our own principles in order to make contact with other human beings of Earth as well. But we will not do that and also will not deviate in any other way from our directives. But we do not want and also are not allowed to exercise any caution to convince the earth humans of the truth. We may only do what is within the scope of our directives, and these state that we have chosen you by determination and that you should spread the truth at your discretion. However you want to manage that is up to you, because you are a free life form. Explain to your friends that we are not willing to fulfill their questioning demands for a contact with them. It's absolutely impossible to go along with that, in every respect. For the time being, you should furthermore also not take any additional photographs of my beam ship, because the ones available to you are completely sufficient. I've given you ample opportunity to create good photo proofs, which are nevertheless doubted in many cases. Hence it should suffice for the time being, because it is neither our nor your task to lift doubters and critics from their consciousness development inhibiting doing and acting. The tasks lie in completely different areas, which is known to you. That doesn't sound particularly friendly, Semjace, and it also disappoints me in the sense that I shall not take any more photos. I bought a movie camera during your absence because I wanted to shoot a film of you and your beam ship. I am very sorry for your disappointment, but my determination shall remain the same. But I still want to allow you to use your movie camera, in the sense that you may film my beam ship. However, you are not allowed to do that up close anymore, and you also may in no future case capture me myself on film but I will give you a short demonstration with my beam ship. Thank you. 
I also wouldn't be able to film up close because otherwise the camera would be destroyed. You told me earlier that I could photograph your new ship at close range. As you know I did that during your last flight away at the last contact. Unfortunately it didn't work out right because my new photo camera exploded in my hands so to speak. The exposure meter and the viewfinder were destroyed and the camera was flung from my hands. I had to hand it over to a costly repair. See pictures on page 58. Is that really so? Of course, should I lie to you? Certainly not, and it also wasn't meant that way. I am sorry for the incident, and I will investigate it.